One of the predominant characteristics of consciousness is our conviction that we're endowed with free will. Yet reconciling free will with an orderly world governed by laws is easier said than done. This project was taken up by the German philosopher Gottfried Leibniz. A towering intellectual figure from the 17th century, Leibniz adopted the mechanistic perspective of his times, but held that the determinism of Newtonian physics concealed a deeper, more elegant reality. God imbued minds and bodies alike with souls that were perfectly synchronized, like two clocks set to the same time, yet without any causal relationship between them. By claiming the existence of a pre-established harmony between what goes on in our minds and what happens in the external world, Leibniz was able to preserve personal freedom as an aspect of our consciousness. Leibniz's quest for free will led him to investigate the nature of possibility and necessity. Why is there something rather than nothing? Is this the only possible world? Or are there others that play by different rules? Where two plus two equal five? Or gravity repels instead of attracts? Nothing takes place without a sufficient reason. In other words, nothing occurs for which it would be impossible for someone who has enough knowledge of things to give a reason adequate to determine why the thing is as it is, and not otherwise. This principle having been stated, the first question which we have a right to ask will be, why is there something rather than nothing? What do we mean when we talk about what must be so? as opposed to what might or might not be so. What do we mean when we... I play this game with my son, which is trying to elicit his intuitions on what genies could do, what a genie could do, and what a genie couldn't do. And kids cotton on very well to this game. They think, well, you know, a genie could make a cat that was 15 feet tall in the air. But a, not even a genie could make 2 plus 2 equal 5. Not even a genie could make something that was uh, both true and false at the same time in the same way. Leibniz concluded that this world is the best of all possible worlds. In his words, the one which is at the same time the simplest in hypotheses and the richest in phenomena. The contemporary American philosopher David Lewis held that claims about possibility and necessity require the real existence of other worlds, a position known as modal realism. Lewis asserted that those supposedly hypothetical worlds are really out there. The world in which Lee Harvey Oswald shot at Kennedy but missed. The world in which Shakespeare decided to stick with acting, and so on. For Lewis, Every logically possible world must really exist. So the idea was that there are infinitely many space-times that are no spatial temporal distance from our space-time. And he explained necessity and possibility in terms of them. So for something to be possible, for it to be possible that there's a, uh, a, an individ, uh, a human being that's uh, three inches tall, there'd have to be a possible world in which there is a human being who's only three inches tall. While his metaphysics was initially met with disbelief, Lewis's views opened new avenues of investigation, and he has been credited with rescuing metaphysics from logical positivism's dungeon. Interestingly, contemporary cosmology has put forth ideas that are closely akin to Lewis's including the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics and the idea of the multiverse in which new universes are continually springing into existence with randomly selected values for its physical constants. Were these constants chosen so that life would be possible in our universe as the so-called anthropic principle would hold? 
Are we here simply because we happen to live in the universe endowed with the right cosmological constant? Whatever the answer to these questions, metaphysics finds itself once again in the middle of the debate. You know, one sometimes hears of metaphysics, oh gee, these, the nature of metaphysics is to raise questions we can't answer. Not so. Maybe some metaphysical questions are like that, but it's hard to say in advance of thinking hard which questions are ones that are destined to forever elude us, and which questions are such that when you think hard about them, sort of, you get to see what's going on.